Hello, hello, and welcome to our webinar on ChatGPT and text automation. Today, we will answer some of your questions and some of the questions we've received from our customers on ChatGPT and how to use it in an enterprise context. My name is Anna Linnick. I am a strategic assistant to the CEO of Rotresco, and I have a background in computational linguistics. And um, over the years at Rotresco that I've um, consulted multiple customers and worked on projects, um, I have gathered quite a lot of experience, which I'm happy to share with you in some way or another. And I have also my colleague Toby with me today, who will introduce himself shortly as well. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Toby. I've been working at Retresco for more than 10 years now. Uh, my background is also in computation linguistics and my specialization, if you will, is in machine learning topics. So over the years, I've worked on many customer projects at Retresco and then switched over to the product side a few years ago. And I also advise teams internally across different departments on machine learning topic. Um, yeah, that's it about me. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, Retresco, and why is it us who are talking to you about, um, about the ChatGPT topic and uh, large language models? What do we know about this? So, Retresco has been in the business for 15 years. We did machine learning and natural language technologies before it was <laughs> became cool a half a year ago when, um, when generative AI became a big, big topic for everybody. And uh, what we normally do is we unleash the power of AI for our customers' business. So we take all these beautiful new technologies and we figure out how to use them to help you achieve your um, business goals. And we have uh, we are a team of about 70 and we've done over the years, um, so we have a couple of our own products that we built um, to that also now receive a generative AI upgrade or have received already uh, the generative AI upgrade, and we have um, successfully built over 250 custom AI and natural language technology projects, um, solutions, uh, which are being used productively. So we have quite a bit of experience, and hopefully, again, we'll be able to help you understand um, better um, all the nooks and crannies of, of this uh, interesting new topic. And this is a good way to start because we have quite a lot of ground to cover. Um, we're just gonna go straight ahead and uh, briefly, I'll briefly tell you what the agenda for today is. We will do a, um, a short introduction and explain the basic concepts of ChatGPT and GPTs in general. Then we'll talk about the use cases and the business value that these technologies bring. Uh, we will uh, also talk, of course, about the impact on the workforce and um, organizations. And we'll dive a little bit deeper into the technology to explain what the drawbacks and the advantages of the technology um, are. And we, of course, will touch on the security and the risk management that's associated with it, and then answer some of the um, frequently asked questions and give you a short strategic recommendation. I hope that's okay for everybody. Uh, here, I'd like to also mention that you're welcome to ask questions. Please write them in the question section and we will address them towards the end uh, of our conversation. And if we don't get to it um, for one reason or another, for, for time reasons uh, mostly, then of course, please uh, feel free to get in touch with us and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have and help you figure things out. And uh, on this point, I'm happy to hand over to Toby who will give you a short introduction to the to ChatGPT. Um, right. Um... What is ChatGPT and, and how does it work? I, I will briefly explain what it is, and, and maybe we start actually on the on the next slide. Um, um, exactly. So, um, what does GPT stand for? So, um, GPT, no matter if ChatGPT or GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT is a family of models, um, machine learning models, uh, language models, and GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And what that actually means, or what does this entail, it is um, the generative part of it is that these are programs or model um, that generate well, text or, or images uh, in, in other cases as well, but they generate uh, content that has never been generated before. So it, it doesn't copy um, existing content like old systems, for example, but it really is able to generate new content. And these models are pre-trained on a large amount of natural language data. 
um, they are not only trained on a specific task, but like huge amounts of um, text, for example, in in the case of large language models. And we will also go into this a bit uh, later in the presentation. Um, right. And the, the last part of the GPT acronym is uh, the transformer. And this is the architecture of the model. So this is a deep learning model um, architecture of a neural network um, that is state of the art for NLP problems. Uh, so natural language processing problems in the last years. And um, yeah, these three parts uh, make up the name of these GPT models. All right. And um, yeah, to, to tell about um, a bit about what GPT is and how it works. So those are um, large language models or uh, generative models and how they work is statistics. So they um, yeah, statistically predict the tokens which are most likely to follow a given input, which is also called the prompt. And um, another term you often hear um, when we talk about large language model is foundation models, which are machine learning models that are trained um, on multiple tasks um, or that can be fine-tuned to multiple tasks. We will also see an example of that a little later. And now ChatGPT specifically um, is a model that was fine-tuned to the chat a case uh, you you might call it a, a chatbot it's it's just a yeah it's a model with a chat interface and it was publicly released by OpenAI in November of last year and um, yeah uh, a big hype uh, ensued around it and um, yeah I guess that's also part of the reason why we're here today and ChatGPT is also is based on um, OpenAI's uh, GPT family of models so it's one sibling of GPT3 GPT4 and and um, all the others that will come in the future. And, uh, but which uh, was different a bit is that OpenAI also decided to make it a bit user-friendly um, on the one hand by making a, a graphical user interface uh, that is easy, 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 um, easily usable um, by yeah, almost everyone and also by fine tuning it to this um, chat case. Um, um, yeah, this is very natural to a lot of people to to uh, chat with somebody or or now some something, and um, yeah, this um, this was the reason why it gained in popularity maybe compared to previous models like GPT-3. And um, ChatGPT is estimated to be trained on 300 billion words, um, or is rumored to. OpenAI re doesn't really release. Um, the exact numbers or details of how they train their models. Um, but um, yeah, the contents um, is basically everything you can find online and also um, purchase from other providers, um, which they did. So um, the, the may, like possibly the whole internet books, Wikipedia, um, also code. And um, then one thing that was new in ChatGPT compared to previous models, is a technique that is called reinforcement learning with human feedback. And this was a new thing um, because here OpenAI uh, like uh, firstly or like were the first to incorporate human feedback on the outputs back into the training process. So not only um, text itself, but also feed human feedback on the text. And this also made uh, ChatGPT have a big leap in quality compared to uh, previous models. And um, what you can see in this uh, little image here is uh, the principle of uh, foundation models and transfer learning. So a few years back, um, when you wanted to solve a, a, like some problem with a machine learning um, algorithm or model, what you would do is collect data on the task and then train a model uh, like on the inputs and the outputs for this specific task. Um, however, nowadays, models uh, or like the neural network models that are commonly used are so big, you couldn't possibly collect enough data to um, train a model like only on the on the data of this task. So what is done now in large language models and also image generation models is that first um, we train so-called foundation models. So those are the models that are really trained not on the specific task you want to solve, but um, in, in the case of large language models, just on the whole internet books and so forth. And um, first they learn via this huge amount of data, like the general capabilities of processing languages. 
And then you have this foundation model, like for example, GPT-3 was a foundation model. And then you can, for some task, it might already do something, but then usually you adapt it. Then you take your task specific training data and then you will fine tune it, it's called, um, or adapt it to the task that you want to solve. And um, yeah, this is, this is also how ChatGPT was trained. Um, first, they trained this foundation model on um, on this big chunk of data, and then afterwards they fine-tuned it um, with the reinforcement learning through human feedback and also other data um, to be what it is uh, today. All right. And um, now I will tell about uh, a few useful concepts or um, uh, yeah co concepts you often hear in um, like when we talk about uh, language models in general. Uh, and also ChatGPT, of course, being one of them. And this is um, yeah, a language model and token and uh, what a token is and what prompting is. Uh, I'm sure you all have heard the term. Um, and I will start by introducing a bit more how a language model internally works. So um, language models, as I already said, are based on statistics and um, these are models or programs that can evaluate the probability of word sequences. So that means on a technical level, you input a sentence and you get a number out. Um, and this can be used to generate texts. And how it's done is generating word by word at every step and uh, selecting the next word you want to generate uh, based on the probabilities that the model gives you. So when the model generates the next word in a sentence, it calculates for every word it knows the probability that this word will appear as the next word. And then you can either simply select the most probable next word, um, or you draw a word based on the calculated probability distribution that the model gives you because it calculated the probability for every word it knows. And if you draw from this distribution, this is called sampling. And uh, to make it a bit more uh, illustrative, uh, so in the example below, you can see this quite nicely. Um, as a prompt here, we have the sentence, I ate the pizza while it was still. And now the top five words with the highest probability are displayed. For example, hot with 80%. That means in a simple sampling algorithm, hot would now be drawn as the next word with an 80% probability, warm with about 12% probability, and so forth. And in the sample on the right of it, you can see how context influences these probabilities. So if you add uh, my oven broke to the same sentence uh, in before, you can see that cold and raw are now the most likely continuation. So um, yeah, context has a big impact to, to do this task um, well. Um, yeah, and GPT models and this transformer architecture are, um, um, yeah, are, are very good at this. Let's let's say it like this, right? And yeah, this other term you hear very frequently in connection with language models like ChatGPT is a prompt. And uh, what is a prompt? A prompt is simply the input you give to the model uh, as a user and uh, like as a user of the model. So, for example, uh, an instruction you could give it examples of what you would like it to do, or just the text um, that the model should continue writing. Or in the case of ChatGPT, it is the complete conversation history up to that point. So every time you click submit, uh, please generate something for me. Everything that goes in, this is the prompt. And as just seen, um, the model then generates a continuation of the given prompt word by word. Um, and the prompt in this sense is also like in the pizza example before, the, the context for the model and the way for the, for the user to uh, guide the model in the right direction during the generation. And this process of trying out which prompt works well, how to make the model more or less um, re reliably produce the desired output, this is called um, prompt engineering. Right. Um, right, and the last word that I uh, used also now before, uh, what is a token? So um, I simplified a bit before, um, GPT doesn't actually generate word by word, but token by token. And a token could be anything between a character and a word or even a word sequence. And why does it do it? It is very um, inefficient to use characters. 
um, because then you would just generate character by character. This is very inefficient. Um, the sequences uh, get very long then. And um, also using words is very inefficient because uh, in a lot of languages, you can just also make up new words. And um, if the if you make a list of all words, um, yeah, it cannot possibly be complete. So you need something in between. And this is exactly what a token is. Sometimes it's a character, sometimes it's a word. And um, it's specific to every model. And it was also learned on the whole training data, the whole internet, basically. And this is also why um, what a token is, is actually a little bit different uh, among, uh, like across languages. So for example, in English, one token is about four characters. Lots of words have their own token, but there's also subwords. And but for other languages, it can differ. So it could be, um, for example, for languages that use a different alphabet, that one character is one one token. And uh, why is this important to know? Because uh, GPT costs. If you use it via the API, uh, it's calculated. Uh, the costs are calculated per token uh, in the prompt and the response. So um, Langu languages other than English are more expensive because they use more more tokens. And um, just to illustrate this um, again, so in the upper example here, you can see an, um, a, 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 an English text and the different colors are different tokens. And here you can see in the English text above that almost every word is its own token, has its own color, right? And then you see a similar text uh, below it in uh, Finnish. And there you can see that every word is split into different uh, tokens. And although these texts um, have um, this almost the same amount of characters, around 380, the tokens of the Finnish text are almost double. So this means um, yeah, processing Finnish with GPT would be more expensive than processing English. Um, just a thing to, to keep in mind, this is, this is how it works. And uh, yeah, giving back over to Anna for business value and use cases. Thank you, thank you. And I hope you've understood everything. If not, then let us know and we'll go deeper into it at the end if we have the time. And we'll switch back a little bit. We'll switch gears and we'll talk about the use cases right now. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what can be done with GPTs. Some of you might have tried it already. Maybe you don't know what, what else could be done with it. So here I am to talk about that. So first, of course, um, the automated content creation is a, is a use case um, that you've all probably tried. Um, you can create marketing posts, blog posts, um, you can create essays, you can create uh, you know, short descriptions and so on and so forth. So you can create a lot of content um, automatically using it with very short prompts. Um, and you can, uh, of course, do question answering. This is, again, as Toby said, these models are specifically predestined to uh, work in dialogues, uh, in a dialogue mode, and that means, of course, that uh, they can answer questions extremely well. And thanks to the reinforcement um, learning with human feedback, uh, they are they got they get even better and better at this um, over time. Um, exactly. So that's something that they're very good at. They can answer questions uh, that can be uh, general knowledge, and they can answer questions that can be more specific. If you add um, some content to your prompt which gives the model context, then it, of course it can, they can answer more specific questions as well based on the input that you gave them. Um, they can help you adjust the style and tone of whatever content piece you're, um, you're giving it and uh, adjust it to your needs. They can summarize text and simplify um, content, which is, uh, for example, very important in some public, in the public sector domain, right? If you want to uh, use simple language, for some of the complicated uh, text, that's a great uh, use case here. And classification and categorization is another case. So you can give it a large amount of data, uh, text data or otherwise, and you can ask it to uh, classify or put it into different categories or groups. Uh, it can do that and it can also uh, do it sort of without you giving it the specific categories, which is clustering. So it can cluster them. Uh, in some way, in some internal logic that it can find. And uh, that could be helpful for topic discovery, for example, for journalists and, um, and such like. Uh, of course, it can be used in conversational systems, so chatbots and assistants and so on and so forth. It can be also, of course, and it is already used, uh, inclu including in, at Rotresco for software development um, optimization. 
And when we're talking about domain-specific cases, I would first and foremost, of course, mention that customer service is one, uh, one place where question answering and you know, processing large amounts of data uh, quickly would be very helpful. So that's, that's a very common use case. In sales and marketing, for example, in CRM and in other applications, uh, that could be very useful. Personal assistance, of course, uh, we're talking about also automated uh, voice assistance and so on. That, that uh, qu question answering and, and processing um, large amounts of information, including things like your emails and, uh, and corporate data and so on and so forth, could be, um, could be a use case, again, with careful about the, whatever, whatever information you're putting into uh, ChatGPT, but uh, here we're talking about uh, the integrations with Salesforce and SAP and uh, things like that, and Microsoft is about to release uh, Microsoft Copilot, which will also help you use um, systems like ChatGPT in the background to, uh, to perform all sorts of tasks um, that have to do with organization and emailing and so on and so forth. Then uh, when we're talking about education, uh, of course, everybody knows that students already use ChatGPT for writing some of their essays and, and uh, performing some of their mathematical tasks and so on and so forth. Uh, maybe not the, the uh, so easy to, to go about this one or to do something about this one, but of course you can think about it um, in a positive way and it can help uh, process complex information easier, it can um, create you know, fact sheets and, and uh, glossaries and so on and so forth, so it can be very helpful as well. Here uh, in the healthcare domain, of course, we're talking about uh, you know, service here as well, we're talking about uh, medical documentation, we're talking about processing complex information from articles to um, produce insights for, for medical treatments and so on, so lots of applications there. And in software development, um, this is, uh, for example, GitLab Copilot and similar Copilots that help reduce the time that is required to write software code. Right, uh, so lots of customers ask us about the, whether it's worth using ChatGPT, what's the return on investment, and what's the role that it's gonna play in organizations. And here we have to go with a frustrating yet accurate response, it depends. And why does it depend? Is it mainly because you have to sort of differentiate between different use cases and application uh, scenarios in a sense that, so you can do augmentation, so augment uh, whatever humans can already do and whatever processes that are already in place with uh, this automated um, technology. And you can do full end-to-end -end automation, so business process automation, making, uh, you know, setting up processes to run completely without a human in the loop. And these are two sort of separate uh, scenarios and uh, it very much, the return on investment very much depends on how you set this up for yourself. And what we recommend is first and foremost, when you start thinking in this direction is to think about what are your KPIs, what are your business goals and what would you like to optimize? Uh, is this um, operational efficiency? Is this your revenue? Um, or is this maybe customer experience that, that you have and then um, kind of start building your solutions around that and start thinking in, in, um, in your application scenarios, uh, whether you want to augment or automate um, as well. And of course, always um, keep in mind that uh, generative AI, like any other machine learning algorithm is non-deterministic, which means there's a certain level of uncertainty that you have to work with and you have to build in, um, build your processes around that and use human in the loop wherever, wherever uh, you're concerned uh, with the outcomes or wherever you are in need of a more reliable outcome. Okay, so uh, now we're talking again about costs and of course, you know, it's, it's great to, to consider, it's great to play around with ChatGPT by yourself and if, even if you have a plus account, it probably just costs you 20 bucks, which is not that much. Um, but when we're talking about large scale applications and enterprise context, we have to consider that um, you will probably be using an API and you will probably have costs that will scale linearly. So the more content you produce or the more you use it, the higher the costs and they grow just proportionally to whatever your use is. And uh, here we see that, of course, the, the prices sort of um, depend very much on the model. ChatGPT is a smaller model, so the costs are also uh, 
low, very low, and they have dropped. So this is also uh, the pricing story is, is a dynamic one. It's going to change over time. And we see that uh, GPT-3, for example, uh, which is already not the newest model, um, is, is cheaper than the latest GPT-4 model. And this is probably going to also change as soon as we have new uh, releases. And um, now we also have Microsoft Azure, right, offering open API services for their infrastructure. And uh, what you have to know is that the, the pricing is um, just basically um, based on the open AI token prices. So it doesn't change that much in that respect. And of course, when we're talking about, um, you know, privacy concerns and we'll go deeper into that and uh, we we're talking about GDPR compliance, right, and things like that. A lot of you might be asking yourself whether you should be running it on your own premises or, you know, have a dedicated um, sort of secure space to run your models. And it will be possible and it will uh, create additional costs when we're talking about um, maintenance and, um, and run costs of that. So that's something to keep in mind when you're considering building a solution. And we're moving on. Uh, and the next question that a lot of you might be asking yourself is, should I be using ChatGPT directly to serve my customers? Do I even need to build anything around it? Or is it just, you know, it, it works perfectly well on single tasks. So why not just introduce it and use it in the background? And here um, we have, of course, uh, I, I would, the, the simple answer is you shouldn't. <laughs> Don't, don't just a, a, attach it in the background and use it uh, without doing anything. And here the recommendation is um, if, your, if your users are, if your customers are internal customers, so they are uh, employees in your firm that you want to uh, enable doing their tasks faster and just having lots of uh, help with sort of menial repetitive tasks, then be aware that of the risks that come with using ChatGPT uh, and, um, make sure that they understand that they shouldn't be feeding uh, confidential corporate information to it, for example, um, that, and we'll go back to the security uh, in, in more detail in a bit, um, but just in general, uh, make sure that no sensitive customer data are used, um, are used with it either. And um, again, keep in mind that the output may not be 100% correct or truthful, however nice it sounds and uh, perform necessary quality assurance and uh, estimate the running costs and keep track of them, um, make sure that it doesn't, you know, um, it doesn't go over, over what you've estimated uh, over time, which is totally possible. And uh, remember that there could be biases, it's especially important in things like in, in branches such as insurance and banking and education, for example, healthcare, um, there are biases that are built into the model uh, because of the data that it, it uses and you may not be aware of them and um, that's something to keep in mind absolutely okay then uh, what how will generative ai and ChatGPT affect the workforce will it replace the work now uh, the, the knowledge workers or will it uh, you know be an assistant or will you know will we eventually all just be out of, out of jobs uh, our answer is no not yet, at least, um, it doesn't look like that, but there will be a certain amount of, a certain effect on organizations, of course. Um, some of the, some, a certain reca recalibration of tasks and, um, and activities is, is in order because, um, you know, this, this does allow a significant increase in efficiency. Um, it helps to first and foremost eliminate repetitive and high throughput tasks. So high throughput means basically when you have a huge amount of data, for example, and manually going through that would take a, a lot of time or building a system of your own that will go through it um, will take a lot of time. So it's not necessary anymore to build very specific applications for some of these things. And they, it works out of the box. And of course, you have to think about um, so the, the emphasis is on efficiency, right? Not of, uh, on replacing uh, humans, but basically on, on helping them uh, do their job more efficiently, which means reduce time cycles and uh, increase productivity. It will also probably help to improve quality assurance in some cases. So think about it as a spell check, right? Uh, you can do it manually. You can go over your text and, and, uh, and look for errors, but you probably won't be as good as, as some of the automated systems now are. So that's, uh, that's an important point here as well. Uh, and what you have to think about is, uh, of course, upskilling your employees to be able to 
to work with these systems, to use them properly to um, to the advantage uh, rather than to harm uh, your you know their, their day to day work, and that's something that's going to become a topic, of course, in the future. So, um, what does the future of organizations look like? Uh, according to Gartner, for example, by 2026, over 100 million humans will engage robot colleagues, so uh, systems like based on generative AI, uh, to contribute to their work. And we think that actually on a person-by-person -person basis, that's probably going to happen even earlier. That's already happening now. People are using GPT, um, ChatGPT, and G other GPTs in their day-to-day -day work uh, all the time. And we have to think about um, all the applications like Grammarly and your email and so on. Like, like I said, Microsoft and Google are all integrating these features. They are here to stay and they are here to, um, to serve us. And they are already being used all the time um, by, by knowledge workers at least. And this will only become more uh, the case in the future. Of course, uh, for organizations, larger organizations especially, this brings about the cost of transformation, and uh, you have to be you have to be prepared and start working on that and start getting to know these systems earlier rather than later. And on this note, uh, I will hand over to Toby, who can help you uh, get to know these systems by explaining how the technology works. Uh, right, and also a bit what it what it can do. Um... Right, so the first uh, question we got uh, was for which languages uh, can I actually use ChatGPT? And the, the answer uh, to this is, um, in principle, a lot of languages are supported. So, um, yeah, over 95 languages. But the important part to keep in mind about this um, point is that the quality varies. So, um, English, of course, is supported very well. Um, and this is due to that most of the training data of the models uh, and also the content you find on, on the internet is is in English. Um, and bigger languages like German, French, and Spanish, and, and um, others, they also work very well. And the smaller the language gets and, and the less content you find um, about it to pre-train those model, models, um, yeah, the less uh, quality you get also um, in what the, the models can produce. And um, yeah, also for the European market, for example, you couldn't just use uh, ChatGPT to be a customer service agent for maybe Croatian or Estonian. In that sense, they, the models can process Croatian and Estonian, but the, yeah, as I said, the, the quality it decreases with uh, the number of speakers and uh, especially the uh, amount of content you find find online. So it's very important to test it um, for, for each language. But um, yeah, good to know that in principle, um, it is possible and um, yeah, it depends it, uh, depends on the task. And how you do it is um, directly via the prompt. Um, you either write the prompt already in the target language or you ask the system to provide the answer in the target language. You can also have an English prompt and then uh, write, um, tell me the answer in French. And um, besides natural languages, ChatGPT also knows programming and markup languages like Python, JavaScript, HTML, SQL. It can help you formulate your like an excel formula uh, for example and um, yeah so um, assistance with programming or other technical tasks is also a tool you can already use it for um, right so what are the different ways of using chat gpt um, in the bottom let's start there um, it's uh, via the product of open ai which is all, which is called chat gpt and um, chat gpt plus um, where you can pay $20 per month to um, to get priority access and also access to some newer models like GPT-4. Um, right, so this is the one way using their product. The other one is um, integrating their APIs. And here you have the choice between um, using the OpenAI API directly or using um, Microsoft Azure, which uh, also provide the same models as OpenAI, maybe like lagging a little bit behind in the release cycle. Um, but uh, on the other hand, having the advantage of that it's um, Microsoft, um, you might have already approved mic uh, Microsoft services and Azure, uh, Azure's in your company, you might already use them. So um, yeah, this is the, the, the options that exist currently. Um, this is this is all AI as a service, cloud-based, closed source. Um, you will not be able to get the model um, and host it on premise uh, from OpenAI. Also, um, to, uh, to host this model, there's a lot of GPUs, so graphic uh, cards, hardware needed to, um, to host them. But um, yeah, at least right now, OpenAI or Microsoft do not offer this. Um, so this is a pu purely 
cloud-based service so far. And uh, one thing I might also mention is also uh, that the uh, because you can use it through APIs, you can also use it through third-party providers in that sense that integrate the APIs, build something on top and around it, and then sell this again as a new uh, like a customized product uh, in that sense or service. And um, yeah, this is also that uh, something that we will see um, a lot of. Um, what are the limitations of JetGPT? This is going to be a bit of a, a longer section um, uh, because it's very important to be aware of what, uh, where the faults of those systems are uh, when you use them. And um, the main problems that you have, um, uh, maybe you can go back uh, one slide uh, real quick, yeah, is the uh, lack of reliability. So you cannot um, trust these models 100% to always produce the output that you expect them to do. They are non-deterministic and there are some tricks to make them deterministic, but even if you use them that way, um, those models can hallucinate and just make up information and, and they sound very convincing so, but it's just wrong. And um, this is um, a fundamental problem with how these models just are trained and work and how this whole architecture works. Um, of course, um, OpenAI is trying to decrease uh, the hallucinations and there's also techniques with prompting to re uh, reduce the amount of hallucinations uh, these models do. Uh, so when I say hallucination, I mean um, that they output or generate just wrong content. And um, in, yes, here you can see an example. Um, for example, in GPT-3, you ask, uh, or like the prompt is, who is Anastasia Linick from Retresco? And, and the model puts out uh, that she's the co-founder and the CTO at Retresco, um, which is not true. Um, we never know maybe CTO in the future, but a co-founder, it's a little bit too late for that. Um, if you ask GPT-4, she's a data scientist. And um, if you use ChatGPT, um, it at least gives you a warning that it can't cannot um, answer this question correctly, but but you can see um, yeah some some things it might just make up and, and you wouldn't know if you if you don't know the the real answer. So always important to keep in mind um, yeah that this uh, this might happen and this is not always um, uh, uh, preventable at some point. Yeah. Um, can you go two slides back? I just wanted to say a few words um, about the, the other two words, um, uh, the other two points here um, uh, 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 when speaking about the main problem. So limited understanding is a problem. This means either it, the model might not get the context um, of the like where the question is asking, uh, ask in, and also as we saw before, these models uh, they're based on statistics, right? So they are very good at generating. Uh, these uh, word by word or token by token sequences and do so very convincingly and very often also very useful, but they don't have a real understanding um, of what they are predicting. Um, it's, a, it's a statistical machine and not an intelligence in that sense. And the third, uh, um, the third problem to be aware of is bias. Um, these model, these statistics the model operate on, they are um, yeah, derived from the training data and um, you know the internet so you know there's bias in the internet and this is also um, <clears throat> like um, yeah so this is inbuilt into the model and um, they're they're uh, working on reducing this um, like to to not output like really really bad stuff uh, sort of say but it's important to keep in mind that there is bias in these models and we will also see an example now in a second okay thank you now uh, <laughs> let's go let's go on with the slides um, Yes, uh, one technical limitation is um, the amount of input uh, allowed and also uh, like together with the output. So uh, for GPT-4, for example, the maximum with a, with a larger GPT-4 model that you can put in is 32,000 tokens, so 25,000 English words. This is already a lot and this is also the newest and most expensive uh, model. Um, there's a lot of research going on right now to make um, this prompt or like a, for, to allow longer prompts um, and also longer generations, but it's important to know that there is a limit. And um, usually for ChatGPT and GPT-3, it's much shorter, it's around, I think, 2,048 or 4,000 uh, tokens. Um, 
So this is a, you can't uh, put a whole book um, in, uh, now as input to um, ChatGPT, for example, because it cannot process this much of uh, input. Um, until now, at least. So as I said, it's a very active research area to also allow that. And um, what is also important to know is uh, there is a knowledge cutoff. So there is no information after 2021 included in the training data. So if you ask uh, the model what happened in Berlin yesterday, there's no way of uh, the model to know um, because it was just trained under, uh, on data that just up uh, to 2021. Um, but there is a solution to it, and this is to include information into the prompt. Um, so articles, parts of textbook, like, like if you have a secondary system that does some retrieval, then supplies the needed information into the prompt, and then let the uh, chat GPT or like the language model do a task of extraction, reformulate an answer of the information that is given. Um, but um, so this is an... Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a workaround in that sense, and also another workaround um, is that uh, what they introduced now with ChatGPT plugins, where the model is going to be enabled to retrieve um, documents uh, like websites from the internet live, um, right? But if you only look at the model as such, um, it it just stopped training at some point and um, if you don't augment it with external tools like plugins, uh, like prompt augmentation in this sense, then there is this knowledge cutoff, um, right? Maybe just a small note from my side. So there are, of course, other models um, like uh, the um, uh, like Claude by uh, oh, Anthropic. An Anthropic, right? Anthropic. Mm -hmm. Um, that can already swallow whole books and uh, answer questions based on that. So they can swallow a book like the size of The Great Gatsby and work with that. And um, regarding the knowledge cutoff, just the other day, I think maybe even yesterday, um, the G ChatGPT Plus uh, version received an upgrade with uh, the browsing integration. So now you can play around with it. We, we have already played around with it a bit and it's not uh, yet as good as as, as some would expect, but um, it works basically on on retrieving the information from the web and then uh, running the you know the question answering on that and using it in dialogues. Yeah, so this is something we will see in the future that this becomes more and more integrated into, into these models because inherently the model alone is not able to do it. You need need tools around it to enable it, and yeah, then it then it becomes very useful. <clears throat> um, yeah, as mentioned before. Um, there are biases in these models. Um, OpenAI is actively working on reducing these biases. You can see the progression here when you ask um, uh, if you prompt GPT-3 um, with the prompt, men make better doctors than women because um, it will happily um, un uh, write text like they like, yeah, you can see it here, like a totally biased text. And if you ask GPT-3.5 or like uh, yeah, chat GPT, um, it already tries to mitigate this a little bit, um, going into the tradition, um, like how it was, and then goes on to say, however, this is a baseless statement and ignores the fact uh, that women have been systematically excluded and so forth. So it tries a bit better to um, um, yeah, uh, mitigating, just spitting out biases that it knows from historical training data in that sense. And um, also, yeah, here's uh, further examples of this. So GPT-4 uh, uh, just um, goes on to say, um, yeah, it is not accurate to make a blended statement that men are better doctors than women and vice versa. So, um, yeah, as you can see, they're, they're working on it, but it is important to know um, that in some cases, um, it, the model might still have some some bias that, that you, for example, would not like to um, pro like I have in text you you publish on the internet, so it's important to to check for this and to be aware that this can happen even though they're working on it. <clears throat> Another uh, technical limitation of these models, and this is just um, how large language models work, is um, logic. So if you have this little logic riddle here, Marta is taller than Ben, Noah is taller than Sven, Sven is taller than Marta. Who is the tallest? Um, you can derive from this that Noah is the tallest person of them all. Um, however, it's not an easy task for a language model, just um, because predicting this, this predicting token by token 
um, is not really a good approach to solving these logical riddles. <clears throat> so um, ChatGPT here, for example, goes on with, uh, with saying this is inconsistent information, uh, does not allow us to determine who is the tallest, but uh, this is wrong. You actually can uh, determine that Noah is the tallest person. And um, they're also trying to work on this. So um, I don't know, on the next slide, do we have an example of GPT-4? Um, I think uh, it, it comes a little later. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is another case here. Um, if 12 musicians can perform a piece of music in 10 minutes, how long does it take uh, 24 musicians? So this is a little bit of a trick question. It says first, it will take them five minutes. So if you double the amount of work, you, you just uh, do, uh, you have half of the um, amount of time you need. Um, but of course, in the case of music, you need world knowledge to understand that this is not really true. Um, GPT-4 is able, if you, uh, if you tell it uh, this is wrong, do you know why, to correct itself. Um, but you can see in both examples, um, in the first place, they really ran into the trap we, we gave it here, uh, so to say, um, which is not something a human would do. So um, yeah, still, we, we have to be careful with these kind of logical computations, let's call them. Um, yes. <clears throat> um, right, so um, can I use my own data with ChatGPT is a question we often get. And, and the answer to this is yes and no. So you can um, include your own data in the prompt. So um, yeah, you, you can include a document in the prompt and then ask uh, ChatGPT or another GPT model to perform a certain task on that data. Um, the other option in machine learning is to, like what I also mentioned before, is to find you a model on your specific task with your own data. And OpenAI provides a um, API to do that. Uh, but only for GPT-3 models, so older models they have. For the chat GPT models and um, GPT-4 models, fine tuning is not available yet. Uh, we don't know if it will be available in the future or not. Um, however, a lot of use cases, um, for a lot of use cases, it's also not needed to do that. So um, um, augmenting the prompt with documents, especially when they make uh, the context window that you can put in there bigger uh, is often enough, um, right? <clears throat> and uh, the next question is, can I personalize content with ChatGPT? Um, uh, for this, uh, this is a yes. So ChatGPT and uh, or like the, the new GPT models all work very well for changing the style of a text, for example. So we can instruct ChatGPT to make a text more emotional or more factual. Um, we can all influence these things via the prompt. Um, we can prompt different styles and also the complexity for different target groups. You can make a text more simple to understand. Um, you, you can even ask it to uh, insert um, technical terms, <laughs> of course, you uh, should uh, to make it um, more complex. Um, of course, you uh, should be able to check if it did it correctly. But yeah, those are all things it can do very well. And um, yeah, a lot of future use cases are built around um, the API of those models with custom prompts, um, where in the prompt you described which stylistics um, you want to have in the text and um, um, personalize the content you generate via the prompt. Right. And um, yeah, another question we often get is, do I need structured data like uh, for other computer systems? And the answer to this is no, at least not to the same extent that the old systems do. So uh, what what, uh, what ChatGPT or in, in the GPT models in general is that they can extract relevant information from pretext fields if you have the right, or like if you find the right prompt to do that. So um, the probability of errors increases with the difficulty of the task. Um, but in a lot of cases, it already works well enough. So uh, use cases are becoming possible that were not possible before before when you didn't have structured data. Um, our recommendation is to have a human in the loop at a later stage to do the quality control, because if it's a hard task, very dirty data, or maybe it's just a few examples, it might just not work on them. But um, across the bench, um, it does work now without um, having structured data. So um, uh, this is an exciting new um, use case or like a new use case has become possible through that. And um, uh, yeah, another question we also uh, get often is, can I produce and use text directly with ChatGPT? 
And um, here we would say it depends on the use case. So it might work well enough for single sentences. And um, as we saw before, there's no guarantee of truthfulness and correctness. And um, the longer a text gets and the, the more token you generate, the risk for error increases, um, of course. And here, um, yeah, it depends on the use case. We have to ask ourselves um, now, um, what, what are we generating here and, and what are the uh, what happens uh, if there's hallucinations, wrong information in there? Am I liability for inc incorrect information in a product description? Will I increase my retour quota through this? Um, if you work in marketing, you want to maybe make sure about your brand safety and that there's the same tonality across text always. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, it really depends on the use case. Our conclusion recommendation is um, where ChatGPT is already very useful is to help an author write single texts. Um, um, yeah, so if, if you're working on one one blog post, um, brainstorm with ChatGPT, maybe it even writes a few um, paragraphs already for you. But if you move into the domain of generating thousands of text uh, webshops, which you maybe would like to publish without proofreading every single one of them, our recommendation is to use a tool with, with more control, um, like for example, the text engine product we have, because um, yeah, there you might want a little bit more re re reliability if you don't have the human in the loop. Yes. Um, right. Um, now for a few slides and a bit of information about the providers and the ecosystem. Um, one question here um, we get is, um, is ChatGPT a substitution or, or danger for search? Um, so uh, here I also would say it depends. Um, on average, of course, uh, there will be changes uh, by this new technology and how users will fulfill their information needs. And what we already, what we will see in the future, and what we already see right now is the fusion of search and large language models. For example, uh, you see the Bing um, search engine already um, integrated, like a Bing, a large language model as the Bing chatbot, or uh, the other way around. In when you have a model, uh, the product like ChatGPT, they introduce the the browsing plugin. So um, yeah, those those things will merge, and it will, and which part you use more. Um, or like uh, the users will use more will depend on their um, yeah their information need and, and the specific use here. Sometimes you really want to make sure to read the original source. Sometimes you just might want to get a quick overview and a summary of um, different sources. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the use case. One thing that is upcoming though and very interesting and we'll see a lot of increased usage of large language models for is enterprise search. So internal systems for knowledge discovery and extraction. Um, this is going to be possible um, either with integrations to the API or also open source models in case um, you want to protect your data and not send it to um, OpenAI, host an open source model uh, in-house. Um, I will also touch on this a little bit later. Um, but maybe uh, already quickly here, open source uh, large language models are catching up. They are not as good yet um, as the models provided um, by OpenAI, um, but there's a lot of research in the community um, also around open source LLM. So there will be exciting possibilities also to have these custom custom systems uh, based on open source components in the future. Um, I can you go one slide back um, about the other. One more. Toby, Sorry. just conscious yeah. about the time. Yeah, we are yeah. we are minutes away from the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm uh, trying to speed it up a little bit here. Um, so um, there's competitors. Um, the, all the big labs are working on these large language models. Um, besides OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, Meta, U.com, and and others. Um, exactly. Open source. I already mentioned and. Um, as it is commercially attractive to develop such models, albeit very expensive, uh, there will be uh, competition. So um, yeah, right now OpenAI has the models with the best output quality, but this might change in the future. The market um, is still very, very new in this field. Um, yeah, maybe I, I will maybe touch briefly on this. Um, only there's a series of models. And we have mentioned some of them before, GPT-3, ChatGPT, GPT-4, 
um, they are advancing, they are training new models, um, but in the interest of time, let's not go into this in detail. Yeah, and agreed. Move on. Yeah. Right. Uh, maybe I can just skip to the security and yes. your questions, right, uh, quickly. Yes. Okay, so we talked about um, the safety for your employees to use the ChatGPT models directly in their daily work, right? So be warned, um, the servers are in the States, right? OpenAI is a United is an American company, so all of it, all of their servers, all of their infrastructure is, is in the United States. Of course, now we have Microsoft Azure, and they have um, dedicated servers in in Europe, which helps you to uh, be more compliant in this respect. If you're already working with Microsoft Azure, uh, you may still need to get an approval for these components um, to, or for, for this uh, sort of component to work with. And uh, until then, until you're you're you're, you've integrated that. Be careful with the information that you're feeding the systems. Uh, don't use any confidential data because you don't know what's going to happen to it. You don't know if it's going to come out uh, at some at some later point uh, for someone else. And if your confidential data is going to be uh, less confidential through through the training of the system, and there will always be uh, some people who will be able to see your information. Uh, even if it's not used for training, it's going to still go through the infrastructure and through uh, and be saved for at least 30 days um, for compliance reasons as well. But uh, then just be sure to um, set all the guardrails in place for your organization. Consider uh, issuing guidelines for your colleagues. And uh, there is now the private mode for ChatGPT, which allows uh, you to opt out of storing or of, of, of uh, allowing OpenAI to use your data for training, but they still have process, they still are able to process and um, look at your conversations internally if need be. So be warned. Uh, right, how much content filtering does ChatGPT do? It filters obscene and abusive content, but you can't rely on the fact that it filters everything because it is also done automatically um, and with human feedback, uh, but be warned, right? You have to use a human in the loop if that's something you're concerned about. Uh, can Who can see your interaction history? Pretty much like every other web tool, right? Every developer that works on it could probably, or I'm not sure about that, but um, they, they should be able to see it uh, if needed and access it. But as I said, there's pr privacy uh, mode and um, you can use that to exclude your data from training. That's also by default now the case for the API use. Um, will my interactions be used for multiple training? As I said, you can opt in or opt out of that now. Um, it used to not be the case. It used to be yes by default. To whom does the generated content belong? It belongs to you. And we already had one question regarding attribution rights. Uh, it will be your content. And uh, there are a few lawsuits now that can potentially change the, the future of generative AI. Um, about the how legal it is to use copyright content uh, for, for training and uh, all of that is going to be uh, sorted in the future one way or another. Right now this is all, um, it, it's all very new and uh, the guardrails and, and uh, guidelines have to be put in place and the governments for that has to be determined by various industries. Um, can I identify whether a piece of content was generated using um, a large language model in short? Uh, no, not reliably. There are efforts like um, GPT-0 to try to identify it, and there are efforts for watermarking content to be able to identify it later, but um, right now this is all in progress and in development, and there is no stable way to do it. Um, shall I create a set of guidelines for using ChatGPT in your organization? Yes, 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 absolutely. And uh, ethical considerations, I will skip through them uh, aside from maybe one uh, big one, eloquence does not equal truth. It's very important to know that these models just write very, very nicely, very uh, in, in very good form, very untruthful things sometimes, and you have to introduce all sorts of um, quality assurance when you use them directly. Uh, conscious of the time, we're running out, uh, so I hope you can have a look at it and ask us questions if you're interested in more. We all know about deep fakes. We all know about how it can be used for fraud and abuse, or you've read about this in newspapers probably. Um, so use the necessary quality assurance and uh, make sure that you understand that it's a black box, um, like every other machine learning model. 
right? Then uh, we do have a, a bunch of other questions that we, I'm afraid, uh, haven't been able to touch base on in time. If you're, if you have the time, please stay behind for a few more minutes. I will quickly touch base on them. And if you don't have the time, then you will be able to watch it in the recording, and uh, you will. You're welcome to get in touch with us to learn more, of course, absolutely. Um, so to those of you who have to go, thank you so much for participating. And to those of you who stay for a few more minutes, I'll briefly touch base on these um, on these questions. How can I use ChatGPT as an assistant? Uh, so you can integrate it into various systems. You will probably need to uh, adjust and fine tune uh, or use your own data um, to be able to do that. Some of the common software like Microsoft Office will integrate um, some of the, these capabilities already to be able to assist you with your tasks. And if, you're, if you want to use it in a voice assistant, that's also of course possible. And um, some standard libraries like Rasa already offer the possibility to use generative AI to, um, in voice assistant. Does ChatGPT right. only answer questions uh, or can it ask as well? um it uh, it does not so inherently but you can prompt it to do that so um yeah um, if you just prompt it to do solve a certain task it will not do this but if you explicitly tell it in the prompt um to to ask clarifying questions then it will do this although it's it might not be reliable so it might not always ask all the information it actually needs but um uh, yeah so the the general answer is maybe no um or like a bit if you prompt it to uh, okay. Right, and the next question, can ChatGPT learn from real dialogues how to answer a user? Um, we already touched on this uh, briefly before. Um, you can provide real dialogues from the prompt. Um, you cannot fine-tune your models, uh, or you cannot fine-tune at least uh, the ChatGPT models to uh, on your own on your own data, at least right now. So um, the, the, the answer here is uh, it's limited to the prompt. Yeah. Okay. Then we have a question about uh, enterprise search, so restricting ChatGPT to only use your data, um, your given information. It's not possible out of the box right now. So um, this is something that we expect will come out as, as, as an option uh, in the near future. And uh, right now you can combine sort of systems uh, that do retrieval, so that work with your data based um, and with your data and then use ChatGPT to sort of do the question answering part. And we already built some of these systems for, um, we've built a few prototypes for our clients. So it's possible um, and in the future, it may be possible also out of the box, but right now it isn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, how creative is ChatGPT? Um, for, for, to this, I would answer very, so like creative use cases, like uh, brainstorming, um, helping you yeah, to come up with ideas for a certain task. Um, and also formulating things. It, it is very useful already. So these are prime use cases for ChatGPT, and this is something that uh, works already uh, very well. Yes. Okay. Um, so next question is about uh, creating variants for existing product texts um, that can that are recognized by Google as relevant and not duplicate content. So uh, you have to you have to sort of control that, and you have to put the you have to um, in the best case, use use specific tools um, to to help you do that, because that's not something that you can guarantee, right? If you just feed it into ChatGPT, it might just rewrite a couple of words, and that will not be unique, and it will be recognized probably as duplicate content. Um, so there are ways to do it that are a bit better. But yes, you can rewrite text, whether it's going to be recognized as Google by Google or not. Um, Google has taken down basically the limitation on on uh, on auto generated content mainly because it's so hard to recognize in some cases and what they say is basically as long as the content is useful um, they don't, don't have any problem with it um, and informative so you can do it you, you have to sort of control that that's that's what really happens or use tools that help you do that and um, is ChatGPT usable in customer service i've already touched on that absolutely yes uh, it can help you work with your technical documentation for example or any other documentation that you have um, and help your uh, customer service officers or in potentially even be used in systems like uh, in, in web systems standalone systems like the zalando chatbot if you haven't heard of it zalando is releasing uh, a chatbot that helps customers um, 
basically get a better online shopping experience that's powered by, by ChatGPT. So um, that's that. And we will finish by some recommendations. Um, first and foremost, uh, get to know the, the new kid on the block. So get to know the new technology, play around with it. Um, learn what it can do, uh, get yourself an account and start using it in your daily life. Um, it is still at a very early stage. So it's been maybe like eight months uh, since the, the release of, uh, of the of GPT-3 and there's a lot of hype around it. So, it, you know, you still have to make sure that you, um, you understand that that's not the same as introducing it on a large scale uh, for your enterprise. Um, then the output can be formulated very well um, and, and sound really good, but be entirely untruthful. I'm repeating this and repeating this because it's a very important bullshitters are worse than liars. That's very true. Um, and for that reason, we re really recommend that you focus on governance, define the guidelines for your organizations. Don't just stop and ban it uh, because people will be using it anyway. Um, they, it, it's a really useful tool. It can help you in, 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 in increase your productivity and efficiency. Uh, so just define the guidelines that help you use it safely. And uh, to do so, you can you can consider creating a task force that will report directly to the C-level that also keeps you up to date about everything that's going on. Everything happened, you know, new things happen basically every day. And to keep uh, on track with that, uh, you may want to have a dedicated task force to do that. And Consider setting up a roadmap and a discovery map because um, in order to, again, bring this to on a, on a scale of your organization um, and make it usable on your organization, you may want to uh, introduce some guardrails and put some, some uh, special or put more thought into it, let's say, um, before you just connect it and start using. And as always, start small, focus on the quick wins and the low hanging fruit um, before you take on really big um, tasks and uh, just get to know what is possible through um, trial and error. That's always our, um, our motto our, for ourselves and uh, we recommend this for you as well. And if you have any questions or you need some help, let us know, get in touch with us, we're happy to help. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, unfortunately we didn't get to the questions we'll be happy to get back to you offline um, and answer them i think some of them we already touched base on in in some of our content and if you have more questions let us know thank you so much and thank you toby thank you anna and goodbye goodbye